I, I came at this kind of from the perspective, I know a lot of you um, have some experience already producing crops, producing vegetables often, and you know, so, so, so coming from that context, how, are seed, how is seed growing different, and what are the things you want to think about when you're choosing a crop uh, in order to be successful out of the bat? So first thing I was going to talk about was uh, timing. And so there's a few different aspects of when we think about how, are, how is growing seed different uh, when it comes to timing. Uh, the, the first and most obvious maybe is just the, the length of time. So for most, I mean, some crops, obviously, when you're growing a fruiting crop like you know, winter squash, for example, it's going to be relatively similar between if you're growing it for seed and if you're growing it for, you know, just for market. But for things that, that we just grow vegetatively, like lettuce or um, uh, cabbage, uh, the, the, you have this whole other part of the life cycle that the plants are going to have to go through. And so in order to make sure that you have enough time, that's going to do a couple of things. First, you're going to need to, you might be able to plant many, many successions of a given crop throughout the year. You'll have lots of slots if you're growing lettuce, say, for market, uh, for when you're going to plant that. If you're growing it for seed, um, you're, it's going to be a much more narrow window for when you can you know, be seeding that and transplanting that in order for it to successfully mature seed uh, and be able to harvest it before the, you know, fall and winter rains come. So, you know, that's the first aspect of timing is that you're going to have a relatively narrow planting window. The second aspect of timing is it's going to be in the field for so much longer. And so that affects a, a number of things. One, it affects your uh, kind of the, the, the cash flow and the, and the, and the profitability kind of on a per acre basis. And this is something I, I come from California. And so this is always a challenge for um, people considering seed growing in an area uh, that allows for multiple crops on a you know given piece of land. You're all of a sudden having to switch that and potentially where you could have maybe had three crops in a year or you know two crops in a cover crop. Now you've got you know just a seed crop. And so it, the value has to be there either, you know, internally or, you know, externally to make up for that additional time that it takes to grow a seed crop. Um, also, the timing uh, plays a factor in thinking about things like disease, like weed management, like pest management. All of uh, those issues can grow exponentially as something stays in the ground for longer. You know, you might be able to escape your pests and your weeds, you know, if you've got a quick crop again picking on lettuce, you know, I mean, to, you know, to, you can potentially, you know, have, you know, some kind of stale seed bed, you know, be transplanting into it and, you know, harvesting it before much you know, management of, of, of pests and, and weeds has to be done. But if you're dealing with the seed crop, well, you've got many, many more months that's, that's in the ground. And so if you don't actively manage that crop, all of a sudden things that you can avoid are going to become overwhelming. And so that's another aspect of where the timing of growing seed really is different than growing vegetables and something to keep in mind. Jared, I'll, I'll yes. make one more point on that one, which is that uh, being in California and the Sierra foothills, we've uh, interfaced with timing issues as well in terms of um, uh, flowering, time of flowering, and the temperature of the flowering time. So right. understanding your own um, little microclimate in relationship to the types of seed crops that you're growing. Because if you, like one time we grew a huge uh, broccoli grow out and we had an unseasonably uh, mar a warm March and we did not get a single broccoli seed set on 500 broccolis that we'd rogue down to. And, uh, and so we learned very quickly about how to plant broccoli with the right timing so that we would get adequate seed set. Um, so it's, it's learning sort of the intricacies of each crop in relationship to the land that you're growing it on. Yeah, that's a really good point, Rowan. So I mean, there's sort of, again, you know, often there's more flexibility when you're growing a vegetable crop in terms of, you know, there, there may be times of year when it's like, okay, it's just too hot or it's just too cold to grow something for a vegetable. But seed growing, you, you're, you have even more constraints. Often the, you know, kind of pollination, fertilization, early seed set um, uh, 
time frame is one where you have really things can be very sensitive to temperature, to um, uh, humidity, uh, to you know the the presence of insect pollinators, and so you have to think, okay, when will this crop be flowering, and what time of year will that be, and what will the climate be like, what will the weather be like that time of year, and you have to work backwards from that. And then also on the harvest end, you have to be thinking about, okay, when will the seed be mature, and will that be in time before, say, rains come? So the timing, often you're much more constrained in your timing. Uh, spacing, this is often the case where for seed growing, it's going to require much wider spacing for uh, producing seed of a crop relative to just growing it for a vegetable. So, you know, where you might be fitting, uh, say, you know, you know, three rows, four rows, five rows of, you know, lettuce on a bed, now you're going to have to be going down to, you know, a single row or maybe a double row um, and much more widely spaced between plants. And so um, thinking about that kind of spacing in the context of, okay, well, can you do both seed production and, um, you know, vegetable production in the same place? Some people take advantage of this difference in spacing to be able to um, first grow a vegetable crop and then thin it out and then make it a seed crop. So that's one difference in terms of how you're spacing uh, is they're just, it's wider spacing. Uh, and that comes into play for a couple of reasons. I mean, so the first is just that, you know, well, mainly, I mean, seed crops are going to get much bigger than a vegetable crop. And so uh, if you don't allow for wider spacing, you're going to have, uh, it's going to be, you know, a, a much denser crop, will, which can allow, uh, you know, diseases to spread more easily and will make harvest harder. So irrigation, difference in irrigation is that Often, basically, general rule would be once a seed crop is beginning to bolt and flower, the there becomes a much more increased risk of running any kind of overhead irrigation, and because you're creating opportunities then for disease issues. And so, this is this is you know there's two parts of that. You know, first is okay planning ahead for your seed crop, so that way you have a way to be you know, furrow or drip irrigating your seed crop once it gets to that point. But the second, and this is something that I often hear people who are doing mixed seed and non-seed production, is that you have to think about what crops are around that seed crop. Because, you know, you might need to be, you know, if, if you've got, you know, a lettuce crop or, a, you know, carrot crop that, you know, you're trying to germinate those carrot seeds and you need to be overhead irrigating, well, that can't be right next to your seed crop that's finishing up. And I, I see that again and again where people, if you don't plan ahead, you know, to think not just, okay, what's growing next to my seed crop now, but if it's something that's going to come out and something new is going to come in later, you know, what's going to be there later? I have some, yeah. di I have some diagrams too in my, in my slides. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll yeah, so Rowan will yeah. detail that. But so that's an issue in terms of planning for irrigation, not just of your seed crop, but of the surrounding crops. Um, so um, other thing to consider... Um, is when we talk about um, pest, when, when we talk about pest and disease management, and Frank's going to talk about that at the end of this uh, talk before lunch, uh, is that uh, you can have an issue where where one of the one of the big challenges with seed is that you can have everything seeming to go well, and then at the end, if you've got a disease that is you know a seed borne disease, or you've got a pest that managed to reduce germ, everything could seem pretty close to fine. And then, you know, it's often, you know, a yes or no, like, is this, is this good or is this bad? You know, whereas in vegetable crops, you might just have some coals that you're taking out and, and seed, you may end up losing a whole crop if you've got a disease that is uh, problematic. So knowing your diseases, especially the key seed borne diseases becomes much more critical when you're growing seed crops. Final kind of thing, again, considering which seed crops you want to grow, is the thought about um, kind of cash flow and risk. Uh, and what I mean by that is that you often, not only do you have a much longer timing of, of, of growing your seed, you know, much more time in the ground, much more, you know, potentially more inputs into it in terms of 
labor and land, uh, but you're going to have a much longer, slower payout. You, you know, if you're growing something uh, wholesale, you know, on contract, well, once you've, you know, pulled that out of the, once you've harvested that seed, you've got to get it cleaned, and then it's got to go to the seed company. They're going to test it, and then it still might be a while before they cut you a check. And if you're dealing with something that's a biennial, you know, a two-year crop like, you know, carrots or beets or something like that, you know, you might be, you know, it might be a year and a half between when you, you know, first planting that seed and when you're getting a check for it. And so, you know, if you if you don't have a plan in place to manage your cash flow, it's it could be really, you know, you need to be able to wait for that money to come for you. And so that can kind of be a, you know, a, a challenge. And the other issue there kind of on the risk side is that, you know, likewise, um, Sometimes it's really, you know, you can invest a year and a half in something, and again, if you don't know until you get your germ test back that, you know, you've made any money on this crop, um, you know, it could be very different than, you know, if you just see, okay, well, it looks like I've got, you know, uh, you know, you know, there's there's some reason my, um, you know, my lettuce, my salad mix, or my, you know, baby spinach got a little too weedy. I'm just going to plow it in and plant again. You know, you, there may be, you might not have any good clues that there's something amiss with your seed crop until you've put in all that time and sent it out to get it germed and get it back again. And so that can be a big risk. So some of those things are things to consider when you're deciding, okay, do I want to grow seed? What kind of seeds do I want to grow? Um, what kind of seed crops do I want to grow? Um, so the other piece of that, so these are kind of the big picture. There's other two other pieces which get more to the question of, okay, well, what seed crops make sense to start with. And those, for m most of you, you already know this, this story, but there are two pieces of, of kind of information uh, that you want to think about when you're thinking about seed crops. And those are uh, the isolation distance that's required and the population size that's required. I'm just going to talk, I'm going to define those in a second, but um, Basically, those both relate more or less to this concept of our, is your crop more cross-pollinating or more self-pollinating? In other words, uh, people use lots of different terms for the same thing. Some people would say, is it more of an inbreeder or an outbreeder or a outcrosser? Um, and for convenience, most of us tend to just divide the world into half and say, okay, that's you know, okay, that's a selfer, that's a crosser, um, but really it's a spectrum, and there's this wide range um, of things that primarily self-pollinate, where they're getting um, most of the seed that's being produced as the result of a pollination between, you know, within a single, you know, within each flower, um, versus cross-pollinated, where pollen is flowing from other flowers, potentially from other plants in the field, um, and then resulting in a pollination development of seed. What you see is on the spectrum, um, and, and one of the things with biology, of course, is there's lots of, of, of caveats and exceptions to every rule, but, you know, this is kind of more or less how you would, could picture things as, you know, with peas and lettuce being on this highly self-pollinated spectrum, um, things like, um, you know, escarole and endive being over there, um, you know, most common beans being over there, um, and then, you know, transitioning over to more and more um, cross-pollinating as we go down the, the spectrum. And besides this just being a fascinating piece of biology, this is relevant to you as seed growers for two reasons. So the first that I talked about is this idea of isolation distance, which is basically how far do you need to grow your, uh, uh, your seed crop from, how far do you have to keep it separated from another flowering uh, variety of the same species. So the key here is of the same species. Um, and this is one of the things all of you as seed growers are going to want to learn your, you know, your, your Latin or your Greek because um, what really matters here is, is species. And of course there's some exceptions there too. Some things that are defined by species still can cross. And, um, but more or less it's, it's a good thing to know. You know there are most of you already know there's multiple species of squash, and they can often, you know, live side by side without cross-pollinating. But you can grow a, you know, cucurbita papo 
um, gourd and a cucurbita papo summer squash and a cucurbita papo pumpkin, and they're all um, the same species and they'll cross. So knowing um, what the species is will tell you, okay, if I have something of the same species and it's going to flower when my crop is going to flower, I need to keep it isolated by a certain minimum distance, the isolation distance. And this distance is by and large depending on how highly self-pollinating the crop is, uh, how, if it's cross-pollinating, the pollen is carried. Is it being carried by an insect or is it being carried by the wind? And these distances tend to increase as something becomes more cross-pollinating as it pollinates by wind instead of insects. But to get to the idea of, okay, well, what crops make sense to start with? Often we're looking at the ones that are ha ha more highly self-pollinated that are require slightly less isolation distance. This is really nice, especially if you are trying to integrate seed into a diverse farm because then you're not, you know, one of the big challenges that people face is, okay, if you're growing a seed crop, that might cross off, you know, a whole species for your market production because you don't want to have external cross-pollination. If you're dealing with something like peas or lettuce, you can still be growing other varieties, um, either other varieties for seed, multiple varieties for seed, or you know, varieties for seed and varieties for market. You know, if you're growing corn, you may not really have that option unless you've got you know, fields that are far enough apart from each other. Um, something to keep in mind here, um, first off, all these numbers um, and pr probably ones that are even more accurate and specific are in our seed saving guides that are on the table and you can, uh, there should be enough for everyone to walk away with one of those. Um, and second is that this isolation distance, uh, like so many things in seed growing, depends. So it depends on a number of things. It depends on first um, how big of a seed crop are you dealing with and how big of a uh, area of flowering, you know, of, of flowering crop of, of another variety of that same species are you dealing with. So if you've just got, you know, a little, you know, 10 by 10 foot patch for seed and there's another little 10 by 10 foot patch of something, you know, that's half a mile away, well, that's maybe fine, but maybe if we're talking about two acres of something and two acres of another thing, then you know there's just that much more pollen in the air. There's that much more places for that pollen to land. Um, so that becomes something that you gauge sort of the risk of cross pollination on is how big of a plot are you growing for seed. Um, another factor when you're thinking about this isolation distance is are there any kind of barriers? Is it just an open field between potentially two things that can cross pollinate, or are there uh, trees or um, you know, some sort of uh, interesting thing for uh, insect pollinators to stop at and, you know, scrub themselves on and maybe never go past. Um, are there buildings in the case of something in a more urban landscape? So some sort of physical barriers can allow you to decrease these isolation distances somewhat. Uh, another factor that would allow you to decrease these isolation distances really, well, one of the things to keep in mind here is it really is sort of about risk management. Life is messy and cross-pollination happens and the question is how, you know, how much are you concerned about an occasional cross-pollination event? So, you know, the, the classic example would be in the world of, um, you know, kind of larger conventional seed production when they're deciding how far to isolate fields between um, different productions of the same species, they're going to say keep, they, they might just say, well, it's just, if you're growing um, one species or one variety of red beet and you've got a neighbor that also wants to grow red beets for seed, you're going to need a mile apart, say. But if you're growing red beets and your neighbors are growing sugar beets, then you're going to need, you know, three miles or more. And the reason being that, well, if, you know, one in a thousand or, you know, one in 200 seeds are the result of an accidental cross between one red beet and another, you know, how noticeable is that going to be? How much of a problem is that going to be? And, you know, can we accept that? Um, you know, on the flip side, you know, if it's a sugar beet, it's going to be really obvious, or Swiss chard, it's going to be really obvious that there was a cross, and people aren't going to be as happy about that. Or the, the classic case of, you know, there's the story of uh, a, 
gourd, um, some gourd pollen getting mixed into delicata squash. And what was it? It was like one in 10,000 seeds or something like that? Yeah, I mean, one in a thousand, you know, just a small amount of crossing happened in this large delicata seed production field, but the gourd was carrying this gene for extreme bitterness that, you know, just caused people to, you know, just have the, the yeah, I had the desperate, yeah, like constricting of the throat because it was so bitter. And so, I mean, that whole seed lot was, you know, had to be gotten rid of and gone back to. So that was something where the, you know, the risk was much higher. And so the tolerance um, has to be lower, and the isolation distances have to be greater. If you're concerned about, you know, genetic, you know, getting GMO pollen, you know, if you're growing corn or beets, you know, or more and more things, you know, popping up every day, you know, you know, squash, you know, now a little bit, um, and you know, more coming down the pipeline. Um, you know, if you're concerned about, you know, having a zero tolerance policy for GMO, either because you're doing GMO testing. Um, of your seed lots, you know, or because of your personal philosophy, well, then you're you're going to really need to make sure that you're well isolated from any potential sources of contamination. So, all of those are kind of factors that can shift this isolation distance up or down. But again, you know, when you're considering what seed crops you're going to be able to grow, and you know, think about, okay, how much, you know, how what other crops of that same species do you want to be growing at the same time? Do you have enough? Um, space to be able to isolate them or not, and if not, then you know you may only either be able to grow a single variety, or you're just maybe not going to grow that particular crop for seed that year. Let's see, what was the question again? Just oh, what's the wh what are the what's the best way to do GMO testing? Yeah, I don't I don't have the the, the a good answer for that. I don't know if we've anyone. Been, we've been yeah. testing on our farm. Um, yeah. We, we live in the Sierra Foothills, uh, very far away from most commercial uh, dairy production or, or, or field corn production, but we still continue to test for our corn crop, and corn is really the only crop that we continue to test for. We use a, we outsource our testing. It's quite expensive, uh, but we find that it's, uh, it's very important to continue to do that, especially for some of our indigenous corns that we are some of the only stewards on the planet for. Uh, we use this company called Genetic ID, uh, and it's, it's, I, don't see, I don't foresee it getting any cheaper, um, but it's a necessary thing that we do year in and year out. I don't know if any of the other panelists are, are doing uh, exactly. And, and, as a, and as a seed company representative, um, you know, we, if we contract out seed, uh, we take responsibility for doing in-house, or we in-house take responsibility for getting that seed sent out to be tested because it's important to our customers. Uh, we don't... Uh, we don't make the grower incur that cost, which helps, you know, if you have a relationship with a seed company who can help sort of subsidize those costs in some way, shape, or form. But as, um, as a seed producer, you know, for your own use, yes, you have to incur those costs, but I think that um, understanding your sort of like pollen landscape in your environment is, is very key, and I think that those tests help to sort of identify potential contaminants. Frank? Uh, we have we are a hundred percent clean and we have we, yeah we have. Uh, you know I don't hold that information in my head, but I can get. I can tell. Them. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I think. Yeah. Uh, um, so we have because we grow seeds in the Willamette Valley, and because the Willamette Valley is the sugar beet seed growing capital of the United States, uh, we have to test all of our uh, beta vulgaris seeds, beets. Swiss chard, and uh, it's required in some of our ca uh, contracts that either we test the seed or, or else the company will test the seed. And because we also retail our own seed, we just go ahead and test it ourselves and pay for it ourselves. The cost is <coughs> approaching $300 a test. Um, and you need, well, it depends on the test. So for sugar beets, because they're wind pollinated, because they're all around us, uh, you know, and because the distance that beet pollen can travel is so variable depending on storm winds and things like that, maybe three miles is far enough. In the valley, f four miles is the requirement 
between GMOs and non-GMO GMO beta. Um, I am about five miles from anybody growing it. So we basically do a test that's accurate to one in 10,000 seeds. And that is the upper threshold. That's, that's as sensitive as the test can be. The only way you can get more sensitivity is to run that same test on the same stuff six times, and then you can get one in 60,000 if you want to pay that much money for it. So um, that's the threshold, and we use genetic ID also. I think that's probably who most of us would want to use. Um, and as new things, you know, they were threatening to bring canola into the Willamette Valley. So as new things come online, as Jared was saying, there's a, a, a GMO squash, summer squash out there. There's um, uh, GMO chili peppers now. Uh, what's the other the rest of the list? Canola? Anyway, they're threatening to bring canola into the Willamette Valley. If they had done that, then suddenly I would have to be testing all my brassica seed lots. Testing all my beet seed lots, not a big deal. Testing all my brassica seed lots, that would be, well, I don't know if it put me out of business, but the price would sure go up because it costs a lot of money for each lot. Just, yeah, uh, just a little cautionary tale. When I was at Seeds of Change, uh, we used to test all our corn lots genetic ID, dozens of lots, and we had only one time did we have a positive result and we had to reject the lot, and it was a farmer in southern Illinois who I hadn't been to his farm yet, and he told me, I asked him about his location, and he said, yeah, there's a cornfield a few miles away, and, but I've got a hedgerow in between, and it's all cool, and so then I went out there to the farm, and he said, what he called a hedgerow was pretty sad. It was one row of trees, and I looked, and I could see the other cornfield, and it was, ru it was roughly about three miles away, three miles, and we had contamination that was beyond the, the limit. I think it was 99.9. .9. I mean, we, you know, uh, so it's just be careful. Do, do not, I mean, if you are right. contracting for seed, go visit the site first. Yeah, you and know? I think, yeah, I mean, that, that, that brings to the point. It's like, okay, you know, I mean, in general, uh, Organic seed lines, we try and have con relatively conservative numbers, but they're still not numbers that are going to get you to 100%. So if you're in it, it, it there's always, there can always be some sort of uh, strange storm winds or, you know, you know, odd, you know, long flying insect or, you know, nature is just unusual. You know, I mean, they've, they've traced pollen, you know, that's gotten into the upper atmosphere and dropped down, you know, you know 100 miles away. And um, so, depending on, you know, again, depending on what level of risk you can tolerate or not tolerate in the case of you know, GMO, um, you know, genetically, uh, you know, GMO contamination, uh, you're going to want to be more rigorous even than maybe what these isolation distances say. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. This, and is, this has been a longstanding policy debate. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I just wanted to add on, just maybe to wrap up the GMO conversation, is that um, if you're in, like, Iowa or Illinois, there's no responsibility. It's a huge cloud of pollen. Like, there's no way of really avoiding it. Here, maybe there's some silage corn flowering late, and you can go talk to the person and figure something out, and there's direct, like, evidence that they contaminated your stuff. But this field that Steve's talking about, it might not even have been the crossing from that field. It might have been like up the canyon somewhere because that pollen, but, but most corn pollen falls within 500 feet of the crop. So you can have relative isolation if you're not in the corn belt. It's not that challenging. So I wanted to just focus that like management of your stock seed, if you're worried about contamination, making sure your planting stock is GMO free and managing that specifically um, or at least having some backup just in case, you can, you can go back and go back to a GMO-free stash pretty easily and just making sure something really valuable, valuable, valuable to you is safe. Um, just think about it like that instead of thinking about trying to make the whole world GMO-free. That's an impossible, crazy, scary thing to think about. But think about your stock seed and how that's precious. It makes it a lot more um, tangible. Yeah, and I think that 
I think that the example of the Zeppelin Delicato, you know, even outside of the GMO realm, when there was contamination from the bitter gene, and then, you know, Frank had his stash of pre-bitter gene Delicata, then we can go back to these stock seeds. And we'll talk a little bit more yeah, about Yeah, you're going to talk about stock forward. seed, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, which is a really important concept Thankful. and one of the things that will um, kind of leapfrog you as a seed producer is this idea of having stock seed, seed that's for your own planting that is you're you're being more rigorous about your standards than um, I mean hopefully you're always rigorous with your standards but you're paying extra attention to isolation distance population size selection all of those things yeah you have a question uh -huh. organic ready uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. I just wanted to point out that is not a terminator that term gets thrown around, and that's not what that is. That's a genetic lock and key. The problem is we're, we're being forced to put it on our stuff. They should be putting it on their stuff. And that's my mantra, because we cannot put the pure maize gene, which is just an, it's a genetic compatibility trait, comes out of popcorn. We can't put that in all of our ancient corns. It's just not practical. But the guys that are producing the problem, that's what they do. That's, that's their whole thing. They're the ones who do that. We need to put the pressure on them to keep their stuff locked up, not to put locks on our stuff to keep them out. That's what I say, anyway. Thank you, Frank. Okay. So just to wrap up, what I was, the, the last little piece before uh, Pat passes it over to Rowan to talk about the year of growing seed, I was going to talk about the second kind of overview piece of information that you want to think about, which is uh, the population size. So this is how many plants do you want to be harvesting seed from in order to maintain appropriate diversity and avoid inbreeding depression and avoid loss of vigor over time. And just like isolation distance, what we find is that as we get into crops that are more and more cross-pollinating, you need to be saving seed for more plants. And there's lots of exceptions here and lots of debate about the right population size. And, you know, all of these are kind of guidelines with the idea that, um, you know, certainly produce your stock seed, you know, trying to be as rigorous as possible. And you may over time learn that, okay, well, maybe you can get away with fewer um, plants than is suggested here for certain species. And uh, certain varieties even. You find there's actually variety to variety difference in terms of how much they tolerate inbreeding, meaning how much they tolerate being um, pollinated by very close relatives, which would happen when you have a very small population. So, you know, again, you know, the peas and lettuce side, um, you, know, um, you know, tomatoes, peppers into squash, you know, the, all of these requiring smaller populations. And then once you get into the brassicas, the umbels, the amaranths and the corns, they're requiring larger populations. That being said, um, you know, this is largely based on this idea that these ones really will suffer um, from inbreeding depression. They'll get genetically, um, they'll, they'll begin to show more and more deleterious uh, recessive mutation or, you know, uh, things popping out of them. They'll start to get um, less vigorous, maybe have lower seed set. All of this will happen on that cross-pollinated side. But you may have really diverse material that you know, you might have a very diverse uh, mix of lettuce genetics in a variety that even though it doesn't deteriorate um, in terms of the vigor of the crop, if you're just saving seed from one or two plants, you might be accidentally losing some important genetic diversity. So there's other reasons to have large population sizes. Um, but when you're looking at, okay, um, what seed crops are appropriate for my scale and for my farm, the population size, and then also just sort of the, the, the square feet per plant becomes more and more of a factor. I mean, it's easier to get a large population, say, of you know, arugula than it is to do that for um, something like cabbage. Uh, so thinking about you know, um, how much space do you need. Um, you don't necessarily have to grow everything every year. You can have cycles. You can potentially... Um, set up situations where maybe, you know, you and someone else are also, you know, are growing the same seed crop and you're sharing your seed together so that way you can up your population size. 
I know one of the challenges that a lot of seed growers face that are really diverse seed producers, it seems like, is that you know, it may not be an issue necessarily that they don't have enough land to grow the population size. It's just that they may not actually sell enough seed <laughs> of those um, crops to justify, um, you know, growing whatever, you know, 200 parsnips. Um, to, so you may end up with more seed than you need, um, depending on what your outlet for that seed is, if it's retail or wholesale. I don't know if anyone has anything they wanted to share about population size. Yeah, and that actually brings up a point, which is that when we talk about population size, I, I, I said it, but, it, but I, I didn't emphasize it really. We're talking about how many plants are you saving seed from. So this is, this is the end goal. So you want to work backwards from there. You want to be able to plant a lot more than that, so that way you can afford to lose crops uh, to you know, pest, disease, you know, rodents, um, you know, rot and storage if it's a biennial crop that you're pulling out and storing. And you also want to have wiggle room to be able to remove those off types or just to be able to practice selection and save, only be saving seed from the very best plants. So you want to make sure that, you know, you work backwards from what you want and add, you know, 20, 30, 50 percent, you know, depending on what your, um, you know, how much risk there is in losing crops over the season and how much work you'll need to do to improve that variety. I mean, if it's something that you're producing for uh, stock seed and you know that it needs a lot of work, you know, you may be potentially starting, you know, on, you know, 10 to 1, uh, you know, starting with 10 times as many as you need 